Greetings, Kerbinauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is Gateway Project, episode number 16, in which we will be launching the P1 Truss. And you can see the P1 Truss right here as it's lifting off. This is the port side truss assembly that contains three giant radiators, just like the S1 truss that we launched in the last episode. The only difference is I have changed the cargo inside the little bays that are on the front of it because I didn't want it to look exactly like the S1. I want it to be unique from that side, so it's not exactly the same launch, although it is the same rocket. So we are going to bring that up as well as doing some EVA cleanup on the station. And we need to name that Minmus station that was launched in the last episode. We are going to be skipping over the Soyuz TMA-1 launch. Even though it was a historic moment with a Soyuz TMA going up for the first time, my Kerbal said that they were going to go on strike if I actually simulated the entire thing. Because when that Soyuz came back and re-entered in May the next year, uh, it had a problem with its control system, and instead of coming back in on a nice gentle return, it came on a ballistic trajectory, and the crew was subjected to severe gravitational loads. Also coming up, we have Joseph, who is up to something again, and we have to go and use Bill's catcher, because in the last episode, we left some more debris, and Bill is not happy about it at all. Now here, where the, are my struts? They say on link, I can't see the struts. What the hell is going on now? That's just what I need is more glitches. Is this going to explode? No. Apparently I'm going to get some uh, Indian snake dancing here. Let's try the other one. Does that one do the same thing? Try and link it back up again. And yes. Okay, fabulous. Now what's wrong? Ugh. Sometimes these Kerbal attachments drive me a little bit crazy. I check the debug menu, nothing there. I check the uh, debug log, sure enough, null exceptions coming out the wazoo. So a simple reload and oh, thank you, it is fixed. So okay, the struts look like they're back. I can actually go out and do what I intended to do in the first place, which is I want to go out there and clean up some of the parts. We have some ammonia tanks from a previous episode where we repaired the station. Those will go to the Hydra cargo carrier down below the station and we'll put all that stuff in there and get rid of it. Coming up, I have some dissections I thought I would do last time. So I keep saying last episode, but really what I mean is two episodes ago. Well, now we are a few dissections behind schedule here, so we're going to start out by looking at the Minmus rover disassembly. Uh, that's the one where last episode we put the rover on Minmus. You can see this is a 2.5 meter sub-assembly, uh, but we had to put a few extra little boosters down here on the side in order to give it just enough thrust to weight ratio, a 1.71 for starters. So once we decouple that, we go to this stage, and then finally we go up here where you can see that we have an orbital injection stage attached to the bottom of the actual lander. The lander is just a fuel with some engines and batteries on the side, and in there it has a gyroscope. Not a gyroscope, I, I mean a hinge. It has a hinge, and that hinge flips it up so that it tips down this way and lets these ramps, which these ramps are on hinges as well, lets those go down so that the little guy can roll off of there. So let's start taking some of this off. We have a little teeny gyroscope there that helps give it some stability on its decoupler right there. And then there's just a whole bunch of stuff on here. We have a special new camera from the Hull Camera Mod, an AIES radio dish that I've modded in order to make it function properly with remote tech. I'll scum some wheels in here, of course, because he's a rover. Some batteries on the side, more batteries. Uh, that is a interstellar cooling unit to help keep it cool out there in space. Got some RCS engines, another light, RCS. That's a RTG. I only have that on there really. It's a little extra power, but if this ran out of power because it was draining too fast, that wouldn't save me. What this is on here for is just because it helped balance out that camera and it looked kind of cool. So we have another one of those. We got some lights in different places, an antenna there. 
We have some solar panels to help when these solar panels are not deployed, those help out. That's our primary antenna for communication, and we have our monopropellant because I did have some of those RCS engines on the side. More batteries hidden all over the place. Up here we have an arm with some scientific instruments on it. We have a light, we have different solar panels, and all kinds of scientific instruments to help us analyze the anomalies. Now these are just CPUs from the AIES mod that I had stuck on there, keeping them up with uh, the struts to help give me a way to get them connected, because they wouldn't connect unless I put those on there. And that's it. Back in orbit. Bob is out on his EVA, cleaning up the ammonia tanks. Whoa! Watch your toes. Don't break my station. All right, cleaning up those ammonia tanks that we used in order to repair the station previously. And uh, once again, using the awesome little trick I discovered in that one episode where we were building a satellite in orbit, I just stick one ammonia tank on top of the other. In fact, let's get rid of these batteries too. We don't need any part count. And watch where you're going, Bob. You're making the whole station jitter. All right, we'll bring all that stuff down here. And oh, wait a minute. Let's get this last little thing here. Just keep reducing our part count. We'll take five more parts away. I got to keep my frame rate up. You know, I want to keep it up at least like 12 frames a second with this station. And uh, it keeps getting harder all the time because we we'll keep adding on more and more parts. So unfortunately, I do have to keep cleaning up some of this stuff that used to make it look cool. But it'll look cool just because it's getting really big now, right? So I'm not going to worry about that anymore. Still thinking about that poor Soyuz crew that I mentioned earlier. Man, I can't imagine needing to come back on a ballistic entry. That must be something else. They had their antenna ripped off of their capsule on the way back down again. Uh, and they went 300 miles off course as well. We'll get back to that after another rocket dissection. Now, the KSS Watcher 2. This one is a smaller 2.5 meter subassembly and it does not need the extended fairing on the top, so it has a regular fairing. And if we zoom in close on this one, you can see we have our Cosmos Pack solar panels. And down here at the bottom, an AIES engine, a fuel tank. We have some Cosmos Pack fuel lines some monopropellant, liquid, oxidizer, another Oscar, a little end cap just to look cool and give it a nice sleek look. Same thing up on the top. That's a hull camera camera right there. Some more batteries, antenna, pod, lights, interstellar cooling units, some science instruments, batteries, more science, little ladder just in case I need to go do repairs or if I ever needed to rendezvous with this thing I could go over fly over to it and grab onto that ladder but I ended up not really needing to do that and now we don't have this orbiting close to the station anyway because it just turned out that it was too losing too many frames per second to have two ships so close together so I took them away or I took this away and uh, I'll just watch the station from just further away that's what I'll do and so yeah, we have those and that's it. So that's that one. Meanwhile, somewhere in the Badlands, Joseph Kerman has gathered together a variety of rocket parts. He seems to be up to building some sort of ship, but what's it going to do and where's it going to go? Okay, 
We're out here at the Minmus station and we can see Kerbin rising over the horizon as the station begins scanning the anomaly and checking to see whether it's safe for Kerbals to go out there. Now in the last episode, I said that I would give it a name based on whatever anyone put in the comments. And a couple of the good comments that I saw were somebody saying that it reminded them of the Firefly ship and I love Firefly and they said, call it Serenity. And then somebody else said, name it after Kesla because that's the scientist who was responsible for discovering the anomalies in the first place and uh, therefore we should name it after Kesla. So I was thinking I'm going to use both. Let's slow this down here and go here. We're going to rename this as the Kesla Serenity Station or the KSS-2. Now, as we continue to scan the anomaly, inspecting it, and sending the data back to Kerbin, Jebediah is readying his spacecraft, because so far it looks like the scans are checking out. So we'll be sending Jebediah in the next episode to come and dock with this station, and then perhaps go down to the surface and explore the anomaly more directly. Uh, but first, in this episode, we have to go and dissect yet one more rocket that we have let, let slip through the cracks. Another one that we should have dissected in a previous episode, but we're going to get to it now. And here we have the 3.75 meter standard launch that contained the S0 truss. Uh, you can see that I have placed on here some boosters to throw it off to the side. And in the last episode, you saw those go flying away. Then it's just a regular launcher and injection stage all the way up through here. We'll pull that off and look inside at the truss itself. So let's pull up our little readout to show how many parts are in that. So we got 43. But if we take away the space tug here and the space tug up here... Oh, it looks like I started it with that. So if this is the root part, I'm not going to get a very accurate readout. That's okay. I think this was the root. We'll take this off and now we're just one part over normal. So you can see this whole thing. Take a look inside here. So there's one docking node, one part. We have a gantry rail from the robotics pack and that's one part. There's lights on it. If we take those off. Oh, geez. Hate it when I do that. Control Z. Okay, we'll take the lights off. All right, come on, get those, get those. You can see most of this is actually lights. Watch that part count dropping. We're down to 10 now. All right, we'll flip around to the back. More lights, lights. There are lights everywhere. How many lights are on this thing? Well, you need the lights to make it look cool in space, so that's just the way it is. We're down to five parts. All right, there's one. We have a docking node on both ends. Okay, anyway, with everything cleared away and no more glitches making it hard to see what's going on, you can see we're down to three parts. One of them is this, which was part of the uh, uh, tug. One of them is this docking node, and one of them is the whole rest of it. Now look at everything that's going on in there. You see all of that gear? All the way down through there. All of that, one part. So you just need to spend a little bit of time making everything fit just right, and then tweak the data file that it generates afterward in order to make sure that it's lined up correctly, it has the nodes in the right spots and all the coordinates are correct and it has the docking node that's still working and any modules that it might have added for all the gear in here, like making it think that it's actually got an antenna or batteries or any of it that actually works at all. You have to delete all of those from the parts config file. But once you do that, then you've got yourself one nice looking part. And we are back. We're back in black. No, we're back to the launch of the uh, new truss here, the P1 that's going on the port side. However, I made a boo-boo. Uh, so I forgot which direction we were actually going here. I thought that the KSS was crossing from the bottom left going to the upper right. And so I launched in the wrong direction. And now I have to readjust my inclination to catch up with it. This rocket right here is simulating the launch in November of 2002 where the Endeavour Space Shuttle STS-113 
brought up the P1 truss in our dimension and then got into place and docked it. And if I can manage to get it pointing in the right direction, then maybe I'll be able to do the same thing. But I need to give myself a little help on figuring out exactly how to readjust that inclination into the right trajectory there by use it, setting up a maneuver node and using that to point where I have to go. So uh, also we need to deploy the fairing so that I can conserve as much fuel as possible because I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. Uh, at this point, I knew that I was going the wrong way. I know an inclination change is kind of expensive depending upon how fast you're going. And uh, this wasn't planned for, obviously. So I figure I'll just do everything I can to try and minimize the amount of fuel. I'm going to slowly push it over, try and get my apoapsis, my close approach, and my ascending node all crossing at exactly the same point at the same time. And if I can do that, then I think I can circularize with the orbit, combine some maneuvers together, conserve fuel, and still make it there okay. So not done talking about that Soyuz that came back really hard through the atmosphere with their ballistic re-entry, ripping the antenna off of the capsule and sending them 300 miles off course, which meant they had no way to communicate exactly where they were either. After that re-entry, satellite phones became standard issue on all future launches so that if they ever went off course again and didn't have any way to communicate, they could at least communicate with their satellite phone. And that's probably a good thing too, because it does happen two more times on uh, TMAs 10 and 11. They also came back on ballistic re-entries. Okay, so are we going to make it with the P1 truss? And it sure looks like it. We were able to get that uh, orbit up there with this stage still. We, in fact, we have half a tank of gas left. So it looks like I had nothing to worry about at all. And I used my monopropellant to make tiny adjustments to get my course right on track with meeting the KSS. And this time, unlike previous times, I'm not coming in at 5,000 meters per second or anything crazy like that. I'm actually coming in at a reasonable rate that'll allow me to dock and not risk crashing my space station. So, uh, another change I made this time, as you can see right there, I have a bunch of extra fuel tanks on that. So this time, maybe I'm actually going to be able to deorbit that and not need to use Bill's catcher, which is coming up soon actually, in order to deorbit it. Uh, yeah, so this one has a lot of extra fuel in it, it turns out, which is a good thing because apparently I have my probe on upside down. And when you put your probe on upside down, what that means is what you think is retro is actually prograde and prograde looks retro. And I lined it up to go retro, which was actually going prograde. And that pushed my apoapsis up instead of actually deorbiting me, which I realized is the exact same thing that happened to me last time. And that's how come I ran out of fuel, because I was actually going the wrong way. All right, but this one, when I figure it out, I flip it around and I'm able to come back down again. And here we are pulling in the Zvezda uh, solar panel and extending the newly deployed P1 truss. Wow, that's kind of a really awesome picture right there. Look at this. We got the station, we got the sun, we got moon, and we have carbon all in the frame there at the same time. That's really cool. All right, now here's where I'm making my mistake. I'm pointing what I think is retro, but it's not actually. Uh, but I figure it out and I flip it around the other way. And since we're in this uh, cleanup phase, we'll call it, let's just go through a few cleanups all at the same time. We're going to get rid of the injection stage that put our P1 truss up into place and fly that one away with another Star Trek style shot where the the thing we're leaving sort of recedes into the background. We'll go back to the station and now we'll also get rid of the hydrocargo carrier because we don't need any of those parts. We took all those things off the ammonia tanks and all that junk. We packed it all up and now that one's going to go down as well. One slight problem with the hydrocargo carrier here is it has no RCS engines on it anymore. If you recall in a previous episode, I kind of repurposed those and maybe moved them over onto something else like the Canadarm and used that in order to move it around. And then I completely forgot that I took them off of this thing. So when I took them off of the Canadarm, I then put them into uh, some cargo bay somewhere and I think they deorbited. Now this one, I'm letting this go for a little bit because this was just too pretty. Look at that, moon 
and the sun and Kerbin and the ship just all lit up real pretty. Give it a little fly around before it's finally destroyed by deadly reentry and goes up in a puff of smoke. Following that, Bill has commanded that we get rid of that orbital debris we left from last time where I didn't put enough fuel and also flew in the wrong direction because of putting the probe on upside down. So we're taking Bill's catcher out and it is on its way to meet up with that debris. We'll open up the little panels on the top here and kind of use it as a scooper. Obviously that gyroscope is going to be way too big to actually fit down inside, but if we keep the little things open, then it'll act like a nice scoop, I think, and we'll be able to just slowly edge it around ever so slightly, just a little bit at a time, try not to let it get away, move it around until we're facing retro, and then we can get rid of that one. All right, so in the grand scheme of constructing the massive truss with solar panels and radiators, those radiators are pumping through their veins 290 kilograms of anhydrous ammonia for heat rejection into space. Uh, we, you might think we're supposed to do the P2 and S2 trusses next, but actually there's no such thing because when the space station was originally designed, it was going to have thrusters, but they have the thrusters that are on the space shuttle and they have the thrusters that are on the Zvezda, and so they ended up deciding they didn't need it. But instead of renumbering everything since the plans had already been made, they decided that they would just uh, call the or leave the P2 and the S2 out of the plans and continue calling the next segment the P3 and the S3 and so on until you get to the sixes. Now, I have a slight problem up on the station. Uh, the segment that I sent, the truss, it didn't have any lights on it and I need some lights on it in order to be able to see. So uh, we need to send up a progress craft. And uh, that's what I'm loading up right here. I'm going to put some lights inside the progress craft in an extra case so that if I need to deorbit anything using this, the case will be empty. And then we just close up our things here and then we can launch this progress craft up there. We'll dock it up underneath the Zvezda module where most of my progress craft uh, launches go. And we have liftoff of the progress M47. This would be uh, mission number 34 out of the 143 that I'm going to be launching, or at least I'm skipping over some, I'm launching others. This puts us at roughly, I'd say, February of 2003. And once this gets up there, Bob is going to hop out and do another EVA so he can install all the lights on the P1 truss that are currently missing. Next time on the Gateway Project, we are going to finish installing the lights on the P1 truss, launch the ESP2, which is the external stowage platform number two that goes on the side of the Quest module. Uh, we're going to find out a little bit more about what's going on with Joseph and whatever he's constructing, and we will pay a tribute to some fallen heroes, as well as seeing Jeb and crew do a little exploration, perhaps, on Minmus. Until next time, I'll see you later, Kerbinauts.